Excellencies, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this um, afternoon uh, session, Partnerships for Econ Economies in Transition. We have a very distinguished uh, panel that will uh, enlighten us on what it takes to revive economic growth and secure political stability uh, in the countries in transition in this region. To my left, I have the Minister of Planning and International Cooperation of Egypt, Amr Darag. I have then uh, Pro Professor Yusuf Stiglitz, also a Nobel Laureate. I think Mr. Professor Stiglitz is well known for all of us. Then uh, we have uh, the Minister from Tunisia of Finance, the Minister of Finance, Elias um, Fakafak. Then we have also uh, the Executive Vice President of the World Bank, but uh, even more important, CEO of uh, the International Financial Corporation, IFC, uh, Mr. Yin Yong Choi. Then uh, we have Mr. Samar Kore, uh, the President of CCC, uh, and also uh, a co-chair as uh, also like Mr. Chai of uh, the summit here. Mr. Kuri also being a very big investor uh, in the region when it comes to infrastructure. And then uh, we have Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister of uh, Kuwait, Mustafa Jasim Al Shamali. So I think we will give the panel a, a, a big hand at the start and, and welcome. We know that um, the region has been uh, through uh, a big uh, transition uh, the last years. We also know that the region uh, is facing, unfortunately, a slowing economic growth. We're moving from around 4.8% in 2012 to more close to 3% in 2013. And we know this is happening at the backdrop of uh, political challenges, social unrest, and also the necessity uh, to revive economic growth, to create all the jobs that are needed for the youngest generation, the youngest population in the world together with Africa. 70 million jobs have to be created in the coming uh, decade. And we know that more than 50% of the population in this region is under 27. I think um, it will uh, be a good thing uh, to start uh, with the Minister of Planning and International Cooperation of, uh, of Egypt. Minister, um, it's about a year uh, since you had your uh, presidential uh, elections. We know that Egypt are facing um, a lot of uh, challenges, but there are also opportunities. I think. Um, all the participants would like to know what is your game plan, your strategy for securing investments and reviving growth in your country? That's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, as a government, um, I, I just joined the government uh, a couple of weeks ago, but I can now enjoy speaking on behalf of the government. Uh, we as government are facing two main problems. First one is that we are trying to fix and handle problems related to the current transition period. And at the same time, we are trying to fix the problems that were dominating our countries for tens of years before uh, the transition. And this is the, the first phase, if you will, of the problems. The second phase is that everybody in the world, within, the, within our country and outside, would like to see us handle all this and solve all the problems now. Everything has to be done now. If yesterday, that's better. Tomorrow, maybe it's okay, but, but not later than that. And this is causing a huge pressure. Nevertheless, uh, uh, responsible governments have to have, as you said, have to have plans to, uh, to, uh, to, to tackle these problems and, uh, and at the same time we expect the support 
of our fellow citizens inside as well as the international community to be able to handle this huge mission, this huge task, uh, and, and, and to, to permit us to, safe, to, to sail safely through this uh, transitional period. Uh, in Egypt, we have, uh, the, the government actually has been working on uh, uh, an extensive program of reform or, if you will, economic liftoff uh, that has been subject to extensive uh, uh, domestic dialogue in order to come up with a definition of what needs to be done. Uh, our program is actually based on seven main pillars. The first one is to take care of the, on the short term and medium term, of the fiscal problems. Number two, to handle corruption, to take care of corruption and get rid of it. Or, or at least minimize it. Uh, number three, when we do this, we have to not to forget the dimension of social justice. That was actually the main driver behind the, the change that uh, took place. Uh, we also need to encourage investment and create jobs. Number five, We've, we will focus, we are focusing on industrial development. We are focusing on energy sector and uh, mining sector. Number seven, we are focusing on the tourism sector. These are the seven main pillars that we intend to apply and lead over the coming few years in order to achieve our reform. When we, when we talk about international support to our program, we expect that support to be uh, uh, compatible with our requirements and our necessities. Sometimes when we, when we deal with, the, with international funding agencies and organizations, uh, we get a feeling that uh, the support is really for, uh, 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 or not really following our priorities. Uh, maybe other priorities, sometimes the priorities are compatible, but sometimes they are not, or they are not well defined. For example, a project was uh, uh, proposed for creating an IT environment to handle the uh, health insurance issue. Uh, but we have to take into account that we do not have <laughs> health insurance in the first place. So it, is not, it doesn't really make sense to spend on an IT platform while we still do not have the basics to, to have a basic system for health insurance. Uh, you know, things like that. The other important thing is, and which I really, I do realize now only after two weeks of joining the government, is that the, 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 the probably the most important KPI for the uh, international uh, support is whether the money is being spent or not. Is the money utilized or not? But are we achieving the objectives for which the money was allocated? Uh, this is, I know that this is the, the, the job of the government to, to, to make sure that it's happening, but uh, we, we do expect uh, also support of the international uh, organizations to help us uh, uh, more define in a better way and also follow up on the implementation of the, of the support and to make sure that uh, uh, it is really achieving what it is intended for. Uh, there are so many details, of course, but as discussion go. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that uh, reform agenda uh, with us, uh, Minister. And thank you for being here uh, also uh, the second week uh, on the job. Uh, that's very uh, impressive and, and very uh, appreciated. Uh, Professor uh, Stieglitz, you've written a lot about uh, this region in general, but also listening uh, now to the reform agenda of uh, the new government um, in uh, Egypt. Um, will we see revived economic growth in the, in the coming years in this region? And then what, what does it take uh, from your viewpoint? Well, I, I think you, you highlighted some of the, the challenges that that uh, the region is going through a, a, tr a, a transition, particular countries like Egypt are going through a transition, at a time where uh, the global economy is experiencing a slowdown, 
and uh, not just the global economy, but uh, since the trade connections with Europe are particularly strong and Europe is in recession uh, and not likely, uh, I don't want to, be, this is not a conference about Europe, but one has, can say a lot about uh, how flawed economic policies and structures there are likely to lead them to have a long period of slow growth, uh, volatility. Um, uh, it, it really does present a real challenge uh, for the region. Let me, let me try to make just a, a couple comments about some of the things that I think would, would help uh, them uh, address these challenges. And I think uh, the, the, the minister's list uh, it includes a, most of the, many of the things that I would have put on. I think, I think it is a, a good list. A couple of other things um, that I would uh, want to maybe add. One of them is the importance of having uh, a more inclusive political process, uh, uh, a political process in which there's a, a lot of consensus. I think at least to, as we read about it from the outside, there still is a lot of division. I mean, and I, I realize uh, for an American to be talking about political consensus uh, may seem a little strange. And, and um, so I, I, I don't want to uh, uh, say follow our lead. I say don't follow our, our, our lead on, uh, on this. But uh, I think the point is that uh, particularly given the other problems, the lack of political inclusivity uh, consensus uh, makes for a lot, uh, uh, an added dose of uncertainty which will make investment more difficult. And therefore, I think it, it provides a further impetus beyond uh, all the others for having, uh, uh, trying to reach a, a broader uh, consensus across the political spectrum. Um, the second thing uh, I think is that uh, all countries going through a transition have a problem of what we sometimes call transitional justice. How do you deal with the problems of the past? And one aspect of that I just mentioned is really that focus needs to be going forward into the future and not just dealing with, you know, one, has, one can't ignore the past, but, but I think there needs to be a, 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 a focus, for instance, on creating new enterprises as well as just privatizing old state enterprises um, to try to create an environment where, where uh, new, new enterprises uh, can be created. Uh, one aspect of that is, uh, was touched on in a way this morning when they talked about the, the uh, problems posed by budgetary, uh, on the budget caused by uh, subsidies, like energy subsidies. But these also, Distorted prices also represent a problem for investment. Um, investment because uh, today the prices are distorted, but even if they're profitable today, there's an uncertainty about the elimination of those of those subsidies, so that dealing with the subsidies becomes a a, a problem, a, 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 an important part of the strategy. And finally, let me just say a, a word about. Um, uh, the role of international cooperation in this area, which I think can be very important. This region, like some other of, uh, developing regions, is uh, there are very big needs for infrastructure. Uh, and I think uh, satisfying, addressing those needs would itself be, have a very positive, would not only create jobs now, but would also be a complement to private investment that would make private investment uh, more attractive. Um, what's striking about the region is on the one hand, there's obviously a lot of money in the region. Uh, there are a lot of needs in the region. And the question is, how do you bring uh, the two together? And here I think there's perhaps uh, a need for uh, some new institutions or expanding existing institutions. So, um, you know, at the international level, we're a little bit in the same way. If we look around the world, uh, where we have underutilized resources, uh, we have vast 
amounts of liquid capital and reserves, uh, 3.3 trillion in China, and we have huge unmet needs, uh, infrastructure all over Africa. And so we have this incongruity. Markets are supposed to bring uh, resources to where they're needed, and right now that's not happening. And that's why I think there is, there is a, a need for, uh, for instance, in the region, something perhaps like an Arab Development Bank. Um, the BRICS are getting together to, to form a new BRICS bank based on the notions of uh, new mandates, uh, taking advantage of the new instruments, new governance. Um, I think something like, like that might be very useful in this region as a, uh, uh, as a catalyst and uh, a facilitator for uh, the, uh, the investments that uh, would, I think, address some of the longstanding problems in the region. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stiglitz. I, I think there are many points that we will follow up uh, also uh, in the, this discussion. I just wanted to come shortly back to you, uh, Mr. Darag, on two points that Professor uh, Stiglitz mentioned. One was the, uh, his first point uh, related to more inclusive political uh, process, uh, that uh, the political situation has added uh, a dose of uncertainty. Uh, Ho, uh, are you dealing uh, with this moving forward? And the second question is this about uh, energy subsidies. This is uh, sometimes the big uh, elephant in the room. We heard earlier on that on average 10% uh, of all the budgets in this region are used on energy subsidies and there could be alternative allocations uh, for uh, these uh, money. If you could share a little bit of your thinking around that with us. Okay, very briefly about uh, political inclusiveness and there is a lot of debate about this, uh, this point. And, uh, and uh, the point I always raise is what is inclusiveness? Is it like you have a national unity government, for example? Uh, as, as you said, do, do, do you expect to have a, a government uh, composed of both the Democratic and the Republican Party to handle a difficult economic situation, for example? N not very this? likely, I okay. think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 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 or inclusiveness means that everybody is allowed to express his opinion and, and uh, through uh, democratic institutions in a way that will lead to better decisions. And, and when it comes to Egypt, I believe that we are doing pretty well in this, uh, or we are heading to be doing pretty well. Maybe we are not fully successful yet, but, but I, I believe the benchmark would be to establish the, the, final, the second cha chamber of the parliament, the House of Representatives, where you have a clearly uh, uh, defined majority, and you have opposition, and this is inclusiveness. Uh, uh, and uh, and it, it, it is very important to realize that it is extremely difficult or, or, or almost impossible to have agreement on all issues. So the question is how to manage the disagreements. And this is the only way to do this successfully is through democratic institutions. We have our constitution now. Uh, uh, we have an elected president. We have the higher, the upper chamber, chamber of, the, of the parliament, and we are about to have the second one. And then I would say that we have a, a, a very good degree of inclusiveness to, uh, to, to achieve better governance. Uh, when it comes to the issue of, uh, I, I would just also like to refer to the issue of the transition and justice. And we are starting right now, maybe if you are following the news, we are starting right now uh, a big uh, campaign of reconciliation with major enterprises that have been having uh, problems with, uh, with the regime or with, uh, related to court verdicts. And uh, we are forming right now committees in order to settle, settle these disputes. And in the coming uh, few weeks, you'll hear a lot of good news in this regard. So this is part of the uh, look to the future rather than look into the past. When it comes to the issue of the subsidies, this is one of the major issues actually that is hindering our, our progress, or has been hindering our progress. And uh, we are in the middle of all this uh, chaos, you know, the, uh, dealing with the, the, the previous, uh, uh, the previous uh, shortcomings and dealing with the transition. We are also tackling problems that have been there for many long time, for, for, for a long time, including the issue of the subsidies. I, I believe what we, what we uh, 
what we are uh, aspiring to do is to make a balance between uh, maintaining the, uh, the dimension of the social justice and reforming the, the structure of the subsidies. And the way to do this is, to, for example, if you take the electricity sector, rather than subsidizing the fuel that is used to produce electricity so that everybody is subsidized, so the subsidies do not necessarily go to those who really need it, you can liberate the, 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 the cost of the fuel and then you get the final electricity product. And then the government can decide who to subsidize. And this way, the subsidies would go to those who need it. And we are applying the same thing uh, uh, also for the production of, of, of bread, for example, which is very important for Egypt. So we are, we are really starting to tackle this problem, I, I believe, courageously. It is difficult because you know, people have, have, have had it. I mean, they don't want to suffer any longer. Uh, but uh, we are trying our best to, 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 to tackle this problem and get rid of it uh, once and for all within a few years from now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You wanted a short reply? Oh, uh, I guess one, one remark about the political inclusiveness. I mean, democratic processes are, are, are obviously an important part of this process, but there's more to it than that. The, the, the question is, even if you have a majority, the question is the extent to which you include perspectives of the minority and, and, and reach a consensus. You might have an ability to, to, we would call it a winner take all, to, to say, uh, do whatever we want, we have the majority. On the other hand, at some point later, you might be the minority and, and democratic processes try to, or I think if, they're going, if you're going to have political stability, one has to incorporate uh, a wide spectrum of views within the policies, even if you are a majority. Okay, I, I think we will then move uh, over to uh, uh, Mr. Jing Yong Jai. Uh, being uh, the head of uh, IFC, uh, the real vehicle uh, for enhancing uh, private uh, public partnership uh, at uh, the bank. Looking at, uh, at the region, listening to the discussion here, no, also the minister's comment on some of the prerequisites that sometimes are there for investments that not necessarily uh, all the governments are amused about. What, what role do you see for your organization and also for public-private partnerships in general in this uh, region and how to make this successful? One thing is to invest, but is also seeing a yield, seeing growth coming out in the other end. Thank you. I think the, um, the ultimate success for, for this region to come out from the uh, current uh, challenging situation is really uh, can we work together between the public and private sector to unleash the energy uh, of entrep entrepreneurship of the private sector to create the jobs needed and to develop the economy. That's really the ultimate test. So far, I have to say there are you know, pocket of success but certainly it's not satisfactory. So what is the key? The key is to build trust between the public and private sector. And uh, I just heard uh, the minister, you said, uh, you know, we need to look at the past. I, I think it's legitimate, but I think more of the energy, and the professor uh, Stig has also said, should be really used for, for the future. And we can learn from the past, but the most important thing is what can we learn from the past and the, with the help of the international community, let's build the trust. Both sides can play a critical role. From the public sector, I think it's clearly very important to build the confidence by making critical decisions. Now, frankly, there are quite a few uh, countries, because of the past, there are a lot of decisions needed for uh, in, uh, investment that has not been made. And uh, there should be much more transparency, and uh, there should be much clear rule of uh, regulation. Th these are the areas that from the government side can certainly uh, do. And uh, in that regard, between uh, you know, the World Bank group, between the bank and IFC, we are actively involved in dialogue. From the private sector, it's also very important. Got to learn the lessons from the past. First, you should know, I mean, the private sector should know its role in the economy should view the 
public sector should view the government as a partner, should engage with the government on conversations on what is needed. Another thing is very important to, to make sure the private sector's growth is really inclusive, to benefit not just a few, benefit the majority of the people. And uh, by doing that, I, I think you can start to build confidence and uh, putting money uh, into those countries. Particularly, I have a word for the local private uh, investors. We need, you need to lead. IFC is there, the World Bank is there to work with you. If the local capital, uh, local investors start to move, I think that will build a lot of confidence for um, international investors. And uh, my, uh, from my point of view, you know, working with our team, we have been actively engaged in this regard. You know, frankly, the needs of capital in this region is so huge. Whatever IFC can do is truly a drop of, uh, in, a, in a big ocean. But in spite of that, over this year alone, we have put in $2.3 uh, $2 billion uh, investing in the region. And uh, we are confident, uh, we are committed to the long-term future of this region. You know, we all talk about the long-term potential. When you think of this region, it's urbanized, you know, has educated the youth, and actually has a lot of capital. The challenge is how can we build this confidence to start to move the machine? let the capital to, deploy, to be deployed in the areas uh, where it's needed the most. We identified, you know, you know I've seen sometimes we're a little bit clinical. We look at what are the impediments for job creation. There are several areas. One is the, uh, what we call the doing business environment. How we can work with the government and assist the government to improve the uh, environment, sometimes from basic things. Doing business, kind of a, how easy it's going to be, how many days do you need to get a registration? And the second area is really uh, critical, is access to finance. And uh, this region, in spite of the huge amount of capital, is the least intermediate in terms of helping these small and medium enterprises. And uh, we have been using a variety of tools to intervene. We invest in many banks. This year we invest, I think, about $500 million at equity in some of the local banks we feel have the same value with us to really try to do small and medium enterprises investment. We also uh, recently, yesterday actually, signed a very interesting uh, facility, long-term loan facility, together with our partner from EIB and also other development agencies of more than $400 million. It's not just the amount of money, it, this is the uh, risk-sharing facility. Basically, if a partner bank, local bank, willing to lend to small and medium enterprises. We'll encourage them to do it, and if there's a loss, we'll take the first loss to provide that kind of cushion. It's very innovative. Meanwhile, the World Bank and our uh, and IFC team are also providing assistance to the banks and also entrepreneurs to learn how to do SME financing, how to evaluate the credits. The third area has touched upon very important, which is huge need for infrastructure. Sometimes in this region, the job creation is easier to say than hard to do. If you have very high electricity price, you know, even though there are lots of subsidy, it's for residential. For, for industry, not necessarily cheap. And uh, so huge needs, we estimate about $100 billion a year needed between now 2020 for this region to invest in infrastructure. Certainly the last area is uh, skill training. So in each of the four areas, uh, you know, answer your question, we have tar targeted the program engagement, and we hope through our intervention, either directly or through demonstration impact, we can mobilize the banks, the investors, and the government to build a trust and to really uh, start to get things going. I, I think it's critical we need to put action into, into the uh, process. Thank you. Um, Mr. Corey, you're one of the uh, investors uh, in this region have also been building a lot of uh, infrastructure, uh, also here in, in Jordan. L uh, listening to what IFC was saying, no, I, I, I guess is, is, is beautiful music uh, in your ears, but also knowing from you a little bit more, what does it take for you to even step up and, and do more infrastructure investments in this region to then unlock uh, some of uh, the cost that we see 
uh, also related to lack of infrastructure today that makes this region less competitive than necessary. What are the preconditions for you to be even more active in the region? I would like to start with the recent uh, World Economic Arab Competitive Report. It said that the three main impediments to competitiveness in the Arab world, one is uh, weak infrastructure, that's the main one. Second one is innovation, and the third one is the uh, insufficiency of labor frequency. So I'm gonna focus the importance of the infrastructure. As you correctly said, they forecast we need at least $100 billion in the years to come. And not single Arab country has that funds available. And I'm gonna try to tackle the first, what I think the government needs to do, what I would want multilateral to do, and at the end, what the private sector needs to do. So we'll start with the government. Of course, the government first transparency, um, allowing a private-public partnership with the trust, looking at the long-term interest. They have to revisit their uh, judicial system uh, because for investors to come and invest in a certain country, we have to make sure the laws are there to encourage the private sector to come in. Uh, we have to look again at the um, operation and maintenance. Many times we look at jobs, we build them, and then we let who will run the projects. Basically, operation and maintenance is a very important part of the infrastructure that we have seen it has been neglected. Now turning to the multinational uh, institutions like IMF, World Bank, Arab funds, basically, of course, they have to, for us as private sector to invest in these projects, we need the political risk guarantee. We need to make sure that in this transitional stage of the Arab, uh, some of the Arab countries, we need to have some political risk insurance covered. We need to have the uh, access to financing. As you correctly said, the Arab, is, uh, the Arab region is rich with capital, but that capital is not deployed and it is uh, worried to deploy. And the only way for us to bridge that gap is to have multilateral institutions like World Bank uh, bridge that gap. Lastly, I'll talk about the private sector. I think the best thing we can do, as you correctly said, we have to lead. We have to put our own funds. Number two, we have to look at the labor skill. There is a mismatch in the labor skill between the available resources in the Arab world and what is really needed in the market. And I think we have to have a closer ties with both the universities and vocational training schools. And I think we have the expertise to do that. And lastly, I have to say is it's part of our corporate social responsibility. Each, we are all multinational firms operating in more in this region. We have to pay a little bit back to the communities we operate in. Thank you. Thank you. We got a, a good uh, response to that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister uh, Shamali, um, Professor Stiglitz was saying that uh, there are uh, a lot of needs uh, in this um, a part of the world for investments, but there are um, also, uh, the funds are there uh, if there is a, um, is, a, is a willingness. Looking at the challenges uh, that we see in quite a divided region, the Arab world, with, with the challenges that uh, the North uh, African uh, countries are facing uh, then compared to uh, the GGC uh, countries. Seeing it from, uh, from Kuwait with a solid sovereign wealth fund but also a uh, solid um, uh, fiscal uh, situation, what role do you see for GGCs being a partner in this uh, transition and what are the preconditions for being willing to step up because these are also uh, funds that belong uh, to your people. <coughs> Thank you very much for the, uh, this and for the, uh, my contribution. I prefer to say it in Arabic as you are websiting live, uh, webcasting live. So uh, I think if I say it in Arabic, I'll translate what I have in mind to reply on this. First of all, my, you know, contribution will come into, to, uh, into a three uh, points. The first one is 
what we have of planning uh, in, 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 in Kuwait and second what were the the role of Kuwait uh, fund and the uh, third is uh, KIA role Kuwait investment authority role in the Arab world and uh, so I think uh, you uh, have your headset because I'm going to say it in Arabic. I'm already ready. We have started, yes. <laughs> we have started uh, We have started the five-year national development plan till 2014. The cost of this plan is 100 and 150 billion US dollars. This is one of a series of plans that are going to be implemented in future. It is true that during the first stage, the cost was uh, 980 projects that were included in the previous plans or in the budgets of other institutions. However, the new projects are 270 projects that will include uh, other countries as well. The five-year uh, plan includes the following aspects. Number one, to push forward the economic growth by the end of the, of the plan. Number two, to, to support the private sector. And as I said before, the private sector is one of the most important aspect of our uh, uh, society and to increase the contribution of the private sector. By doing this, we are pushing forward the private sector in order to assume its role. We are trying to diversify the financial base in order to achieve the economic growth rate of 7% to diversify the production base of the commercial sector and to increase the non-oil activities. We have another sector which is really very important, and as I said before, it is the oil sector in Kuwait. We are planning to improve the oil fields in order to have better improvement and better productivity. We are trying to increase uh, the infrastructure as well as the social and the economic development in Kuwait. In fact, uh, these are the main aspects of our development plan. For the MENA region, we believe that uh, such countries have a lot of potentials that can absorb so many new projects. So that's why we are planning to have more job opportunities in these countries, given the potentials that they own. We believe that uh, this region needs economic reform, support of their governments. They need good governance and they need good management as well as managerial skills in order to harsen the potentials that they have. We also believe that the MENA region has achieved a growth rate till 2008, which is 5% or 5.2%. And if we compare it between the growth rate in the OECD countries, we will find that it is 2.4%. This means that uh, this region has a lot of uh, prospects in future.
However, I would like to review with you the development fund in Kuwait as well as its achievements uh, in collaboration with the other countries either in the MENA region or abroad. Number one, the contribution of the Kuwaiti fund to the MENA region has reached 9.8 billion US dollars in 16 countries of uh, the MENA region. This includes 320 projects in the following sectors. Number one, agriculture, transportation and the communication, energy, industry, water and sanitation, as well as other social uh, projects and the contribution of development banks in these countries. And now allow me to review some of the projects that were implemented in a number of uh, Arab countries. And as I said before, we have contributed to a number of projects in these countries. In fact, I'm trying uh, to skip some of the main points because I don't want to take much of your time. I would like here to speak about the investment authority in Kuwait. And I am that, uh, the board chairman of the investment authority in Kuwait. Reviewing the activities of this authority shows that this region is one of the most important regions in attracting foreign investment. We also believe that we can achieve more economic growth rates in this region, given the potentials that they have. Starting from the late 2007 and early 2008, the investment authority in Kuwait has changed its own strategy for the Middle East uh, and the MENA region. In fact, uh, this authority is trying to diversify its activities. The investments before focused in, on Asia, such as Japan and other countries in Asia. However, this region in particular is being given more focus and importance. And we do believe that this region in particular needs more investment in order to develop. However, we would like to say that there is one point that should be taken into consideration, uh, which is uh, this investment should be welcomed in these countries, and it should be given the opportunities that uh, it deserves. We have $28.3 billion as investment by this authority in 16 countries. And it includes a number of uh, activities such as deposits, equities, real estate uh, funds, and loans. The total amount is $47 billion in all these activities that are being financed and funded by the investment authorities. In conclusion, we do believe that uh, this region has the greatest uh, economic growth potentials. This region can become a new window or a new Asian power. However, these countries need to change how to deal with investments. In fact, we don't want these countries just to wait for the support and the assistance. And in fact, we have listened before in so many fora that this country needs a partnership between the private and public sectors in order to play a vital role in attracting economic growth and in achieving economic sustainability. 
I'm not here talking about Kuwait, but I'm talking about uh, Kuwait and the GCC countries in general. We would like uh, to be given uh, justification in order to continue our, invest our investments. In fact, uh, we are asking uh, whether this uh, contribution is given as an assistant or it will bring back uh, the return on us. You cannot just take a part of your assets and give it as an assistance unless there is uh, a return on your investments. So this is really a very important point in order to be sustainable in our assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Deputy uh, Prime Minister. I think it's very natural uh, to go then uh, from Kuwait uh, to the Minister of Finance of Tunisia, Mr. Fakfak, uh, listening uh, to the Deputy Prime Minister uh, of Kuwait saying that um, there has uh, to be uh, a willingness uh, to reform. It has to also accept a return on the invest uh, invested uh, capital. It also has to be welcomed. Then uh, there are great opportunities for this region. It can even uh, in the future become uh, the new Asia if one gets uh, and introduce the right uh, policies. Is uh, Tunisia, uh, do Tunisia have uh, the conditions that are necessary to also receive more investment from uh, the GGC uh, region? Hope so, hope so. <laughs> uh, in fact, we are, the transition period is uh, very complicated to manage. We are dealing with a big paradox between uh, give a very quick answer for uh, social demand, for uh, create immediate job, uh, reduce the disparity between region and this is why, and this is why, what people are waiting for immediately. And this can be possible only when the uh, state play a big role and when we expand mo more. And this creates a deficit, and this creates a lack, and this creates a challenge for the future. And uh, this also push the government to start immediately the big reform to solve the, the, the structural week before the revolution, but also the problem created after the revolution. And this is the second paradox. If the government of transition for one year or one year and a half are able to make such big reforms, uh, to make alone such a big reform and to choose alone the new economic model. And in our case, for example, in Tunisia, but I think it's uh, the same thing for all the country in transition. We are in coalition between three parties and they not share exactly the same economic model for the future. And this is, this became more complicated. And uh, this is why I, I emphasize. Well, what, what are the three? What are the? Is it two parties, Social Democrat, and one party, Liberal and uh, Conservative Party? So all together have to more, first deal with this pressure, this quick answer to solve and to to have more stability, to expand more, and this destroy the fi public financial uh, uh, indicator for deficit, and uh, in the same time st start the reform and convince uh, the financial institution, convince all the country who needs to help this transition and who, who want to, to, to invest. So this is only to, to, sh to say how much is complicated to manage a transition, and even if from, uh, we, can, we can imagine that it is a similar thing to manage a, a transition after revolution, in Eastern Europe uh, 20 years ago, or even now in spring Arabic, and it is very different from, from country to country. But in any case, we return back for the fundamental, and uh, I want to emphasize in what Mr. Stiglitz said, that the inclusivity is the main consensus, and inclu inclusivity is, the, let's see, the magic terms 
we, we use and we try to use uh, in Tunisia even to found the consensus for the political issues, but also, and more important, for the economic reforms we need to, uh, to implement. And uh, we start, we took the decision to, to start the, the main important uh, reforms in the banking system, in the fiscality, in the investment code, uh, in the uh, modernization of the administration. These are the main four pillars of our program of reforms. You know, Tunisia, before the revolution, was seated many times as a good student and with the very good uh, indicators, growth average of 5%, uh, uh, deficit low than 3%, 2.5%, also the inflation, uh, quite good uh, investment, uh, private investment, uh, around 22% of the GDP was the global investment and two-thirds was private. But this is, this, all this good indicator uh, was not in phase with the aspiration of people and with the dignity of people and we have a huge disparity between regions and we irritate also a big uh, unemployment rate mainly for young people reached 30 percent and this is why it is necessary to rethink and to, to rethink completely the, the model of economy and uh, we, we focus all in the private investment, how we are able to be more attractive based in uh, our own assets in the good level of, of education, in the strong administration, little bit bureaucratic administration, which need to be more modernized, but we have a strong administration, and uh, how to be more attractive for investor, and uh, all, uh, uh, this is today the main important question we want to, we want to, to deal with is uh, how to reach a level of investment more than 26 to 27 percent from the GDP, how the foreign direct investment goes from 3.5 all last decade, 10 years ago, to at least 7 or 8, and uh, these uh, these are the the main uh, strong objective we want to to reach, and for this we are uh, we are uh, working in the reform I said before. Uh, we we start the reform to access for finance to diversify the finance sector, to uh, consolidate the banking system push more people to go for the stock exchange market and enterprise to simplify a lot the investment for the, inv the administration procedure which are very complicated for investors and uh, these are our priority today. Thank you. In, uh, in the meantime, we, we have uh, four or five uh, axis for, for our economy which we want to, to consolidate and to, to improve mainly for the industry and we are one of the big sites for automotive and uh, airplane component industry and uh, we, we are working to develop and to be more attractive for this uh, inv investment and for uh, agriculture and tourism. These are the main important sector we are looking to increase investment. Uh, unfortunately, the situation in Europe is not so good to help the transition. Nevertheless, we are convinced in uh, working with our neighbor and working as a door for the Africa and consolidate our partnership with Europe. We will succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Now the world is changing very fastly at uh, the World Economic Forum's 
summit two weeks ago in Cape Town, it was clear that the seven out of the ten fastest growing economists now in the world is African economists. And who would have thought that uh, ten years ago? So this also shows that there are great opportunities uh, for this region. I want to come back to this idea of Professor Stiglitz about uh, uh, Arab Development Bank. But before doing so, just very shortly uh, to you, Mr. Darag, as a response uh, to the Deputy Prime Minister of uh, Kuwait. Um, the Prime Minister was indicate, Deputy Prime Minister was indicating willingness to also invest and, and, and support. What, what, what is your short comment uh, to uh, the Minister's um, uh, intervention? Uh, of course, we would very much welcome uh, this, uh, this move and uh, we are really looking forward you know, uh, to having, uh, before, before turning to outside the region, to have uh, our financing needs satisfied from within the region. And traditionally, our relationship, particularly with the GCC countries, have been very good, and we are really looking forward to enhance this relationship and, and build on it. Uh, uh, we do believe that, the, the, that uh, when it comes to Egypt, the relationship with, with the Gulf is strategic, and uh, we can cooperate very in a very good way to, to maintain the national interests of both Egypt and the GCC countries. So our, we welcome this very much. But I would like to, in addition to that, I would like to comment on, on something that is related to the issue of inclusiveness. Because it's, uh, I was, uh, this comment is coming after I listened to the, the talk of uh, my Tunisian colleague, His Excellency. Um, I remember in 2010, we, uh, everybody was talking about how good the Egyptian and the Tunisian uh, economies are doing, and this is a great uh, example. These are great examples for, for uh, emerging countries and things like that. And nevertheless, in a few months, we just had two great revolutions. So, uh, is, <laughs> so what, w one would think that, uh, that is it really related to uh, the, the, the main KPIs of the macro economy? I mean, the, the, the growth percentage and, uh, and uh, the, the reserves and things. Of course, these are very important, but, but I believe that what we, in both countries and many other similar countries we were lacking is the dimension of social justice. In other words, inclusiveness. And, and, but, but this time it is not political inclusiveness. It is economic inclusiveness. As a matter of fact, this is much more important for, for the peoples to be economically inclusive, uh, in, uh, included you know, in, the, in, 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 the, in the economy of their, their own countries. And if you go, uh, normally, the, normally the media talks more about political issues and about disputes and differences in a way that makes you believe that this is everything. And if you, if, you, if you solve these problems, that's it. But if you, if you talk to most of the people, they don't give... Uh, <laughs> let, 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 let's check with, uh, with um, uh, one of the leading economists in the, in the world, uh, Professor Stiglitz, on this uh, economic models. Were the economic models uh, um, not totally reflecting the full picture or flawed in that uh, sense. Do we have to look into some uh, new models also that are better incorporating uh, social inclusiveness? Yeah, I, I agree very much with the minister. I, I think that it, it is very important. I, one of the things that had happened in Egypt before uh, uh, the transition was that they had growth statistics that were not terrible. In many ways, they looked very good, but the benefits of that growth were not widely shared. Uh, in fact, they were uh, uh, not shared at all for, by large groups of, of, uh, of the population. So I think that, that what, what we've learned is that there are several models that have failed. I, I think, you know, the, you might say that the communist model or the Arab socialist model, that didn't work. Uh, that didn't work mar largely because it didn't have any growth or, or very little uh, growth. Uh, the neoliberal model also didn't work. It produced, in some cases, growth, but it was not shared prosperity. It wasn't shared growth. Uh, and it went to a very small fraction, just like in the United States, actually. The 
vast majority of people in the United States have not done very well in the last 15 years. Uh, one of the things that most people don't understand, is, you know, median income for a full-time male worker in the United States are lower than they were 40 years ago. So for large fractions of the population, the economic machine has not been delivering. So the question is, you know, where, where, where can you find a model that has worked? Well, actually, I think the one area, uh, country, a set of countries that has done reasonably well are the Scandinavian countries. Of course, you, you, you uh, not just Norway, which had a lot of uh, oil to help, but, but that's an example of a country with oil that has used it very well. But the other countries don't have those kinds of resources and have, I think have done very well. So I think that version of a European social model is actually one that, that I think the uh, uh, countries of the region ought to look at, with. Without the uh, currency union that caused such a problem in Europe, you know, when, when I was a student in economics, I had a professor called Asar Lindbeck uh, teaching and um, um, another quite famous economist. Uh, he said that, you know, in the room with the five economists, there probably will be around seven to eight different opinions. So, <laughs> but uh, but I, I think uh, based on, on what Professor Stiglitz said here, I, I think also, uh, Jin Yong Chai, uh, you have... Uh, also background uh, from the private sector, uh, Goldman Sachs before you, you joined um, the IFC. Listening to this discussion about inclusive growth and also um, employment piece, this notion of jobless growth and all this, how are those elements also uh, included uh, in your policies when you uh, decide uh, for investments or you don't agree with that angle at all? I, I uh, absolutely agree. We need both. And uh, if we do not do well on one side, the other side is not sustainable. And uh, so that is very much uh, not only kind of theoretical, it has been proven again and again. So from our intervention, we are very much focused on, on both. And, uh, you know, we have uh, most of our, uh, you know, investment and uh, service very much focused on what we call the bottom of the pyramid. And we are very uh, big in SME financing. And uh, we are very, uh, you know, we just had a PE conference. And you know, I'm new to FC, uh, seven months. We had this uh, global emerging market PE conference. More than 800 people showed up. And uh, I didn't realize IFC is, uh, represents 10% of the uh, private equity emerging markets. And uh, you know, listening to, to the audience, I just want to see some, you know, people learn. Even you know, you would argue private equity guys only re focus on return. Actually, not necessarily true. They are talking about sustainability. They are talking about stability because you know, investment in an unstable environment is the, the biggest risk. So uh, from our angle, it's not again not only IFC, the World Bank, our own balance sheets. It's really our ability to influence the thoughts of the partners from the investment world and also from the uh, real sector. You know, I uh, had a very interesting conversation with one of the global leading um, providers of infrastructure. We were talking uh, over dinner during the spring meetings, talking about what has changed post-Arab spring. He was saying, you guys, i.e., you know, World Bank and uh, IFC, think, you gotta think outside the box. We have a different view about the risk. If we cannot help the economy to develop, we don't have a future market. So we are you know, trying to think, stretch our imagination, change the, uh, the concept of, of risk. So what, what I want to say again, you know, emphasize early, our role, both you know, IFC and the World Bank, but more importantly between the government and the private sector, there, there is a true partnership. And uh, I, I think in this region, it's more than ever critically needed. You know, I, we were uh, just talking because of certainly depend on the countries in certain part of uh, you know certain country in this region, government job is the first job and also the last job is the only job people want. We have to change that because you know clearly the public sector cannot create all those jobs. We have to unleash the entrepreneurship, the energy uh, of the youth. We we need to play together. Thank you. I, I was just wanted to, uh, when we're coming um, uh, close to the end here, uh, come back to this uh, 
more innovative idea of uh, Arab Development uh, Bank. We have a separate development bank for Asia, we have it for Latin America and Africa. Uh, Mr. Uh, Khoury, uh, what do you think about this idea of, um, of an Arab uh, Development Bank? Do you think there will be also interest from uh, the GCC to, to contribute and also uh, is there a missing link uh, here, especially if you, we want, as it was mentioned here, uh, you can also in the future see uh, the Arab world becoming uh, a growth area like uh, Asia. I'm sure some of you were yesterday. There is an initiative also called the, it's called the Arab Stabilization Plan. And this is basically something similar. In my view, it doesn't have to be an independent. We can, for example, we have the Arab Fund. We have, in parallel to the Kuwait Fund, we have the Arab Fund. That can be developed specifically into the idea is, as my the deputy minister just said, these countries uh, allow opportunities for investment and for good return. So we have to mobilize the Arab capital available, but make sure the transparency, the return, and the mechanism is there. One idea is, of course, the Arab stabilization plan, or the, uh, as Mr. Dabdoub said this morning, the Marshall Plan. But I think it is needed. Now, how we go about doing it, that's the problem. Minister Darag, uh, would you like an Arab Development Bank? Uh, I don't know whether it will help to add another, uh, another uh, uh, organization that is working on providing finance, because there are several other development banks and organizations that through which uh, uh, some Arab funding can be channeled through. I mean, like the Arab Fund, uh, the Islamic Bank, and, uh, and, and other organizations. Uh, the thing is to have a real conviction that it is to the benefit of, uh, of, the, of the, the wealthy country that the development of the area is really beneficial for the whole area. It is not just for the benefit of the less fortunate countries. And, uh, and if this will is, and as I'm, I'm encouraged today by, by the comments of, of, the, of Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, and, uh, and, and this, this is very important regardless whether we have uh, development banks or we don't, or we have initiatives, and uh, uh, if the will is there, mechanisms will be easy to implement. Professor Stiglitz? Well, uh, first, let, let me say, I, I think that there are, uh, the needs are so great, and the uh, that I think that that there is an opportunity for some additional initiatives, whether it's a Arab Development Bank or the uh, uh, initiative that uh, was just mentioned. Uh, just to t put another context, uh, in Latin America, uh, the Inter American Development Bank is uh, a very important institution, but CAF, uh, which is the bank of a subregion, the Andean Bank. Uh, which has been expanding very rapidly is a very important and actually very effective institution. One of the interesting things, it, it, it's an institution that was founded by a group of poor Andean countries, which, uh, and this institution has a better credit rating than any of the constituent countries. Uh, and it's, it does basically infrastructure uh, investment and manages it very well. It's developed a kind of competency in that specialized uh, area. So I, I think that, that this worry about an additional institution, I, I think is overly, uh, it, it, there's too much worry about that. If it's efficient, if it, if it you know, I, I understand a worry uh, about excessive bureaucracy, but some of these institutions have been able to do it on a very lean and mean basis and uh, to specialize in one area or another. There, there are so many different areas of infrastructure. And it's not just one area. There's roads, uh, water, um, uh, electricity. So, so it seems to me that there is a lot of opportunity. And I think the issue going forward is uh, to try to think through the various ways in which this could be done, uh, the modalities, the, 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 say, the, the institutional arrangements. Thank you. I, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, also the panel and uh, also the participants for uh, being with us here for more than an hour. Listening to, uh, I feel, a lot of very substantial input, 
very thoughtful uh, discussion uh, on inclusive growth, but also inclusive political processes, so we can also see a closer collaboration in the Arab world, uh, going all the way from Kuwait uh, to the Atlantic with, with Morocco, uh, seeing, uh, and this is also the aim of the forum, bringing uh, these countries uh, together, looking at um, initiatives that can be taken uh, to revive economic uh, growth, uh, looking at infrastructure projects, looking also at energy subsidies, looking at the youth skills, um, a training. Uh, there are a lot of um, opportunities, but also challenges. Personally, I, I leave uh, this uh, discussion a little bit more uh, bullish in the sense that I think there are real opportunities, but of course, all this transition is also happening at the backdrop of quite um, a severe economic situation uh, in the southern part of the uh, Mediterranean that also has been quite crucial for at least some of the countries uh, in uh, question. But we're seeing no uh, more substantial growth in, in the U.S. and, and we'll see uh, how uh, this develops. Again, thank you so much to the distinguished uh, uh, panel and uh, uh, thank you so much uh, to the participants. Thank you.